I would like to, um, you know, introduce the keynote speaker today, um, Professor Andrew Cutchins, who is an American political scientist, academic, and former head of the American University of Central Asia. Uh, he has held senior positions at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Center for Strategic and International Studies and Carnegie Moscow Center. He's written many books and articles on the Caucasus and Central Asia, and he's frequently interviewed um, on CNN and for Politico, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Washington Times, the Moscow Times, Chicago Tribune, and CS Monitor. So additionally, Andy has given testimony before the US Congress on Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. And he was my colleague at Berkeley Stanford program in Soviet studies during the exciting years of 1988 to 1990. And we reconnected shortly before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which I'll never forget, and met again online the day of the invasion. So um, my task, as I saw it, under, understood it, is to kind of explain uh, from an American standpoint how we got to, in a way, where we are from the end of the Cold War more than 30 years ago to uh, what I've called the destruction of the dream of a Europe whole and free. Um, although I hope that that, uh, that conclusion turns out to be rather premature and uh, inac inaccurate. Um, but certainly my feeling um, last February, February 23rd, when uh, the Russians attacked Ukraine is that um, the period of this, this 30 plus year period uh, the, F, the idealist hopes like those of President George H.W. Bush to create a Europe whole and free and uh, the idea of the former Soviet General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev to create a common European home, I felt like they were blasted into history by the Russian bombardment armored invasion of Ukraine. Um, let's, uh, uh, I think, is there ultimately our task is going to be thinking about the a new European uh, security order. And so I'll try to run through uh, reasonably um, <clears throat> concisely how we got to where we are. So the, uh, the Cold War ended very rapidly and quite, quite surprisingly. Uh, and I don't think there had been a tremendous amount of thinking about what would replace the uh, European security order. Um, the United States emerged in a rather historically unique position of unipolar dominance um, and would necessarily take the lead in defining the new international system. And at a global level, uh, it was quickly defined in a new US security doctrine in 1992 under the direction of US Defense Secretary uh, Dick Cheney and uh, um, his colleague Paul Wolfowitz as uh, it was articulated as the primary goal of the United States was to prevent the emergence of a peer competitor. Um, <clears throat> you know, at that time, uh, and even today, if we look at where, where could a peer competitor emerge from, there are only three potential uh, rivals, potential rivals, uh, and all of these are in Eurasia, uh, potentially Europe, Russia, and China. But all three of those prospects looked uh, very dim and unlikely in the foreseeable future in 1990, end of 1991. Europe was mainly focused on deepening and broadening uh, its uh, uh, multi-decade long unification process. Russia was in tatters after the Soviet collapse and China's rise had only begun about 13 years before that at a very low point. Nevertheless, I think it's worthwhile remembering that now 30 years on, these goals, while not generally openly discussed, by U.S. policymakers have never been repudiated in any formal U.S. security document. And I think the relevance is a lot greater in the world of 2022 than it, uh, than, uh, than it was 30 years ago. I, I think the sense that 30 years ago was that while European security would not be quite as much as the core of the new system as it was during the Cold War, it was still going to be the most important challenge for Washington policymakers. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, it was George W. Bush in 1992 articulating the goal of a Europe whole and free, and uh, later on Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin talking about a, um, <clears throat> a uh, 
a zone or belt of cooperation and peace from Vancouver to Vladivostok. Looking more specifically at the new states of the former Soviet Union, including the Russian Federation, the US sought to promote the development of sovereign market democracies throughout the vast territory. These broad goals have remained consistent for more than 30 years and not so surprisingly, the results have been uh, mixed at best. I'll leave it at that. The first big challenge that the uh, uh, George H.W. Bush administration faced was the nuclear legacy of the former Soviet states. And this is quite important for um, where we are today to some extent. So with the collapse of the USSR, uh, along with Belarus, Kazakhstan, and the Russian Federation, Ukraine emerged as a nuclear power. And in fact, at that time, Ukraine had the nuclear um, <coughs> uh, weapons as well as uh, fissile materials to be the third largest nuclear power in the world. The priority of the first Bush administration and the following Clinton administration was to convince Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine to have their nuclear missiles and fissile material removed um, so that Russia would emerge as the only nuclear successor state of the USSR. Thousands of missiles were destroyed and fissile materials were removed to secure locations in the Russian Federation, in what was called the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, often named for the two senators, Sam Nunn and uh, Richard Lugar, the Nunn-Lugar Program, uh, who took the lead in promoting the work. Convincing the Ukrainians uh, to give up what would have been, as I said, the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world entailed quite a bit of difficult negotiations for the Clinton administration. Not only was Ukraine giving up the most, but its sense of national identity and fear of a revanchist Russia had much deeper historical roots than those of Belarus or Kazakhstan. And as we uh, know, uh, as part of the quid pro quo for giving up their nuclear weapons in December 1994, the British, the Russians, and the US government signed the Budapest Memorandum, which uh, were to provide commitments from those three powers to protect the security and sovereignty of those new, new states. Now, unfortunately, there was never really any clarity about what those commitments were to be and what would happen in the event uh, if the, it was violated. And obviously, in uh, Russia uh, disregarded the, the Budapest Memorandum in 2014 and much more violently so began just in the last couple of weeks. Um, in thinking about a new security architecture for Europe, um, with the agreement on the unification of Germany uh, and, the unip and the demise of the Warsaw Pact in 1990, the Cold War was over. And so this was when some thinking began about new security arrangements for Europe. And one of the leading US experts in the Soviet Union and arms control at the time, Strobe Talbot wrote in Time Magazine in January, 1991, and I'll quote for you. Uh, the industrialized democracies must strengthen and broaden the existing economic, political and security arrangements and develop new and inclusive ones. NATO, which is still an anti-Soviet alliance must give way to the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe um, the CSCE, later of course uh, changed to the OSCE, uh, with the Soviet Union and its spin-offs as members. That way the future leaders in Moscow, Kiev, Vilnius, and Vladivostok will feel they are participating in and beneficiaries of the Renaissance of which Mr. President Bush spoke about in Once Lost Square. So Talbot's vision was a bold liberal idealist view that acknowledged dramatic change required dramatically new thinking. Um, and while not entire, and I stated entirely directly, he viewed the new Russia as a core linchpin of any new arrangements. Leading Russian politicians and experts at the time also favored the CSCE to become the dominant European security organization in the early 1990s. However, such idealist liberal nationalism was not the natural inclination of the temperamentally conservative George H.W. Bush, and much less so by some of his key security officials. Their first concrete step in 1992 was the establishment of the, the NAC, the North Atlantic Cooperation Council, as a forum for discussion between NATO members uh, and partner states to the east. And then the Clinton administration in 1994 established the Partnership for Peace, promote more concrete cooperative activities and capabilities. Um, that NATO would emerge as the lead 
transatlantic security institution became much more clear with the outbreak of the Yugoslav wars of succession starting in 1991-92. There simply was no other readily available hard power multilateral tool to deal with the challenges. And this demanded that NATO expand its mission and to work operate out of area in non-NATO states, initially in the former Yugoslavia. Okay, this is a really big change in the in the mission of NATO. And while much of the emphasis has been on the uh, uh, the concerns the Russians in particular had about the expansion of NATO, it is perhaps actually it's the expansion of the mission of NATO, which may have been more worrisome. But then two events soon catalyzed greater demand from the East European Central States for NATO membership. One was the major electoral defeat of Russian reformers in the December 1993 parliamentary elections that saw extreme nationalist Vladimir Zhirinovsky and his ill-named Liberal Democratic Party of Russia win a plurality of votes. The second was Yeltsin's initiation of a brutal war in the North Caucasian Autonomous Republic of Chechnya in December 1994. These events together raised the prospect of an aggressive and anti-Western Russia emerging to threaten its neighbors to a greater extent. And of course, historical memories of brutal Soviet and Russian imperial interventions throughout East Central Europe ignited the real push for expanding the membership of NATO. The impetus, in my view, uh, certainly, and I think most others, for expanding NATO was not a plan hatched at the Pentagon. In fact, then Defense Secretary William Perry was the Clinton administration's strongest voice against the expansion of NATO, as he saw no genuine threat coming at the time from Russia, and he was concerned that such action may lead Russia to back out of crucial cooperative threat reduction uh, program efforts. And of course, we know that initially four new members joined in 1999 and uh, 12 more in 2004. Ukraine was never a candidate for membership in either of these two rounds. Now, this next section, um, I'll talk a bit about what I called 9-11 and the onset of U.S. overreach in foreign and security, security policy. So the 1990s was an extraordinary decade for the United States. The economy was driven to new and unprecedented heights with the dot-com boom in the second half of the decade. There was no longer anything approaching a peer competitor to constrain U.S. behavior. And the military successes of the first Gulf War, as well as the rapid defeat of Serbia with minimal losses in 1999, added to the sense that the United States could do pretty much whatever it wanted in the world, and the costs would be minimal. For the Russians, however, the war against Serbia, which they deeply opposed, signaled that they were in no position to prevent U.S. military action, and that even they could be vulnerable for perceived human rights violations in its wars against Chechnya, and therefore even possibly vulnerable to a NATO intervention. Al-Qaeda's attack on September 11th, um, destroying the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and a uh, major damage to the Pentagon, really shocked Washington policymakers in the country at large, to put it lightly. Um, it was likened to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, that brought the United States into World War II, and it was the largest attack on the U.S. homeland since the British burned down the White House, the new White House, and occupied Washington in 1812. Suddenly, U.S. security policy revolved around the war on terror, which started immediately in Afghanistan with the removal of the Taliban in the fall, and then was oddly followed up, oddly, that's a euphemism, with the war on Iraq. Each war experienced smashing initial success, followed up by misguided efforts at nation building devolving into long-term insurgencies. Now, when President Bush, George W. Bush came to power, he didn't really have any strongly held views on international relations and initially was guided by more pragmatic thinkers in, in his administration, like Secretary of State Colin Powell and NSC advisor Condoleezza Rice. But the 9-11 attack emboldened him to be the global leader in a wide-ranging fight against terrorism. And these events opened the door for more neoconservative administration officials like Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, Vice President Cheney, and others to play a more dominant role in influencing Bush's thinking, especially on the advisability of the war in Iraq. Um, the succeeding Obama administration from 2009 on, despite campaign rhetoric of ending wars and focusing more on diplomacy, also found itself 
often relied on U.S. military power, mainly to advance U.S. interests and regime change. The most uh, uh, controversial example was in Libya in 2011, when the U.N. mandate for a no-fly zone resulted in the brutal murder of Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi and General Bedlam and violence throughout the country. It's fair to say that the Arab Spring that began in Tunisia and Egypt and ended in Libya and Syria was a disaster for regional stability in the greater Middle East. And uh, the choices by the Obama administration, from the perspective of Putin, for sure, I've heard him talk about this a lot, but also myself, resulted in misguided failures. Both the Bush and Obama administrations were imbued by an excessive belief, I think, in the effectiveness of U.S. power, especially military power, as an agent of change for good, even democracy. It was Madeleine Albright who had dubbed the United States in the late 1990s as the indispensable superpower, the only state that in partnership with its allies had the capability to right many of the wrongs in the world. But rather than indispensable, the facts on the ground increasingly were leading many around the world to view the United States as a very fallible and destabilizing actor in world affairs. Now, let's turn more closely to Ukraine again with the color revolutions and then the hard push by the Bush administration for NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine in 2008. So it was the series of color revolutions in Georgia 2003, Ukraine 2004, Kyrgyzstan 2005 that led President Bush to make democracy promotion a key foundation for his foreign policy going forward in his second term. The Orange Revolution in Ukraine in late 2004 was really the galvanizing event, I think, for the democracy rapture, if you will, of the president, as well as a breaking point in his personal relationship with Vladimir Putin. From the standpoint of Washington, the 200,000 or so demonstrators who came out spent weeks on the Maidan in Central Square in Kiev in the dead of winter to protest falsified elections <clears throat> that had the more liberal pro-Western candidate, Viktor Yushchenko, losing by a hair to the conservative and pro-Western, pro-Russian Yanukovych, marked a bold and his heroic stand against corrupt governance. For Putin, the decision to avoid these results and run the election again, which resulted in the victory for Yushchenko, was an illegal act supported by the American government, George Soros, foreign-funded NGOs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that was designed to thwart Russian interests and weaken Moscow's in influence and it was an outrage in his view. The U.S. policy towards Ukraine did not fundamentally change at this point. And unfortunately, the Yushchenko government turned out to be a great disappointment on many levels for Ukraine. He was succeeded as president in 2010 by Yanukovych. And then in Moscow in December 2011, Putin again became enraged with the United States for supposedly egging on and financially supporting Russian dem demonstrators to the streets of Moscow in response to the huge falsification of Duma election results. The Russian leader increasingly believed that U.S. operatives would seek his ouster or worse. And the very tough response against the demonstrators marked another watershed in Russian politics towards further oppression, similarly as the color revolutions had in the middle of the previous decade. Now, uh, on change in U.S. foreign, foreign policy toward uh, Ukraine, uh, and Georgia. At the end of his uh, his term, uh, George Bush was pushing very hard for two things. Uh, one of them was the missile defense deployments in the Czech Republic uh, and Poland, uh, which he did achieve. And the second was to uh, push the uh, the membership of Ukraine and Georgia, with the step being membership activ activization plans, MAPS, as the crucial step before membership in the alliance. Uh, together, these were two extremely bitter pills for Putin to swallow. He couldn't prevent the former. Um, but on the latter issue, as you all know, and I apologize if some of this seems like just it's a repeat of things we already know, but I think it's useful to run through. Uh, the latter issue came to a head at the NATO Bucharest summit in April of 2008. Putin made it pretty clear that membership for Georgia and Ukraine were red lines that Russia would not follow. He went as far as to tell George Bush that Ukraine was not even a real country. Nevertheless, the U.S. president lobbied hard, but encountered unequivocal resistance from France and Germany uh, in uh, President Sarkozy uh, <clears throat> and uh, Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel. The summit concluded by making an extraordinary, in my view, quite flawed conclusion. 
The decision was to withhold the maps for Georgia and Ukraine, yet state their future membership was not a matter of whether, but when. Such a statement about future membership of a state was never was unprecedented in the nearly 60 year history of NATO. Mr. Putin's response to that was the five day war in Georgia in August, which resulted in the secession of North Ossetia and Abkhazia from Georgia. Um, in a sense, Putin demonstrate, demonstrated he means what he says about red lines. Um, let's now run to the 2013-2014, uh, the Ukrainian negotiations for the association agreement with the EU and um, Yanukovych's disappearance, the annexation of Crimea, and the war in Donbass. With the transition from Bush to the Obama administration in 2009, Georgia, Ukraine, and the other post-Soviet states were on the back burner in U.S. foreign policy. The Obama administration sought improvement in ties with Russia with a reset policy with the hope that improved ties with Moscow would help the U.S. allocate more of its military force posture towards China and the Asia-Pacific. Uh, these hopes were compromised by the beginning of the Arab Spring in January 2011 and the increasing evidence that the reset with Russia was failing. Um, <clears throat> the EU, on the other hand, was uh, focusing on developing association agreements uh, with key former Soviet states, uh, Moldova, Ukraine, uh, Azerbaijan, excuse me, Armenia, and, uh, and Georgia. The EU was successful with Georgia and Moldova, and nearly so with Armenia, before Moscow stepped in to have Yerevan back out. And negotiations were going very well with Yanukovych in Ukraine until Moscow started to intervene in November of 20, in the fall of 2013. Eventually, Yanukovych turned away from Europe and signed a $15 billion loan agreement with Moscow, a pretty hefty bribe to spurn the Europeans. But the societal response to the turn from Europe was immense. Uh, tens of thousands of demonstrators again came out in the Maidan, setting up camps to stay there through the holidays into January and February with occasional outbursts of violence with the authorities. Um, violence reached a fever pitch in mid-February with likely over 100 casualties. Several days later, Yanukovych fled the capital and his whereabouts were unknown. Looters trashed his opulent presidential mansion and the political situation in the capital was chaotic. Essentially, the protesters had prevailed as Yanukovych de facto abdicated. For Putin, Yanukovych's disappearance meant the total failure of Russian policy in Ukraine, a huge blow to Putin. Putin was still in Sochi closing the Winter Olympic Games when this transpired, but I was certain he would not take this lightly. And uh, I think I am the only person that predicted <laughs> that he would go after Crimea. Um, in a thing I wrote for uh, uh, CSIS on Feb Monday, February 24th. Um, it, uh, uh, on Friday the 28th, the following week, Putin struck stealthily and surprisingly to take over Crimea, the least Ukrainian part of Ukraine, and the home of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. It was a brilliant head fake, as the Russians had deployed tens of thousands of troops and equipment on the northeast border of Ukraine. The U.S. had virtually uh, no intelligence res resources looking at Crimea. On March 18th, there was a triumphant celebration in Crimea uh, and, and uh, Moscow as Crimea was officially annexed by Russia. For the Russian people, um, not only the government, this was a cathartic moment of victory uh, after nearly 25 years, I think of what they perceived as some kind of humiliation at the hands of the West. The Obama administration response was too little too late, and Putin felt empowered to advance on the Donbass republics of Donetsk and Lugansk, as there had been no opposition and little punishment regarding Crimea. But the Donbass proved a far more difficult operation, and eventually a kind of ceasefire was declared in January 2015, and negotiations between the Russians, Ukrainians, oppositionists, and France and Germany ultimately resulted in the Minsk agreement. All right. Um, getting to where we are today. Uh, Low-level skirmishes and fighting continued between Ukrainian armed forces and, and the Donbass oppositionists sponsored by Russia 
and the implementation of the Minsk Agreement stipulation stalemated through the end of 2021. Then in the late fall, the Russians began massing troops again, um, and military equipment began on the Ukrainian borders. Actually, the military buildup began really in the spring, accelerated in the fall. And uh, the Russians in December submitted to the United States a set of proposals, almost in the form of an ultimatum that called for the end of NATO expansion, the pullback of NATO forces and equipment from uh, Eastern European allies, and broad, broader negotiations on a new European security architecture. Um, honestly, I don't fully know what the American response was to the Russians. It's not been made public, but I think it was pretty minimal. Um, while emphasizing their interest in conducting diplomatic discussions. Much of the American political class described the Russian proposals as non-starters, suggesting that making concessions to the Russians would be akin to British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's appeasement of Hitler over Czechoslovakia in August 1938. In other words, a grave mistake. This was the sort of dominant narrative. The buildup continued through January and well into February, while there was a great deal of diplomatic activity in Europe with themselves and the United States and Russia. Finally, Putin made a move on Monday, February 21st, in announcing the Russian recognition of the independence of the Donetsk, uh, the DPR and the LPR. Um, and the following day, Russian military forces officially entered the republics the next day ostensibly for defensive purposes. Then on Wednesday, the 23rd, Russians initiated bombardment, aerial attacks, um, and the invasion of Ukraine from North, East, and South. It's not clear to me actually what Putin imagines his end game to be. Uh, in a rambling speech before the Russian nation and the world that in his mind justified the Russian attack, Putin again emphasized Ukraine was not a real country and that the most legitimate borders in his mind harkened back to Novorossiya of the late imperial period. It was quite a rant he made against the Bolsheviks' uh, nationalities policy, which would effectively make the great majority of Ukraine part of Russia with a small rump state of Ukraine in the West. Um, let me just skip forward here so we um this this has created an enormous uh, policy conundrum for the united states and for europe nobody appears ready at this point to deploy nato forces to fight in ukraine since this could risk a nuclear showdown with russia a warning putin made very explicit on the 23rd to anybody who might consider joining the ukrainians there appear um, limit, real limitations on the policy tools available to the United States and Europe. Uh, the first expected response has been to impose unprecedented economic sanctions, but to some extent Putin factored this in, although uh, as uh, Bloomberg referred to uh, them today, these sanctions really are of a very different, different level than what Russia's experienced, and it's the effect of going nuclear on the Russian economy. Um, what are some obvious things that uh, we take away? Well, the military and intelligence incompetence of the Russians in the first two weeks of the war is startling. Um, we can talk more about that, about that later. Um, but the bravery and effectiveness of the Ukraine military and society, mobilization of society, has been very impressive and especially the role of President uh, Zelensky. Um, however this ends, it's hard to escape the conclusion that we are entering a new era of European security, again, in which maybe new lines are going to be drawn, um, and there are much broader global security implications from whatever this, however this is going to end. Uh, minimally, the United States' desire to focus more military resources and attention east Asia to China is again compromised. NATO has emerged more unified than at any time in recent decades. And, uh, and I think this is also a significant uh, win at this point so far for the European, for the European Union. Um, 
Um, sorry, uh, Professor Kuchin, I just read in the chat that bombing starts in Kharkiv. So, uh, Natalia. No, no, that's an uh, uh, alarm, uh, air okay. alarm is there. Okay, no. good. Uh, sirens here. Okay, no, 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 it's not. If it's, it, it will start, you will hear it. All right, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just about done. Um, looking at all of this in longer historical perspective, it was always clear to me that the admirable goal of a Europe whole and free could only be achieved if Russia somehow felt comfortable and its voice respected in the European security system. Um, I don't go, I won't run through the, the debate about, about NATO. I think we did expand NATO a bit prematurely, uh, but uh, certainly those countries which wanted to join NATO it's uh, entirely understandable why they wanted to, and NATO should uh, take should have taken them in as they as they did. Um, in retrospect, I don't know if there was a way to ameliorate uh, Russian concerns over that. Um, but we don't know what's going to be left of of Ukraine. Um, I'm afraid, as our colleagues just said, the attacks on Kharkiv and Kiev and other large cities throughout Ukraine are going to continue. The damage is going to be much worse. Uh, the civilian loss of life is going to be much, much worse. Um, <clears throat> and I think there is a question for, uh, for NATO. At what point do you actually uh, revisit uh, the issue of, um, of a no-fly zone? Uh, or at least in the in the near term, working more aggressively to uh, get the uh, Soviet MiGs in Slovakia, Poland, and Bulgaria into Ukraine to support the um, Ukrainian Air Force. Um, but I, I think we also should think about well, what's going to be left of Russia. Putin has gone all in on this folly. Uh, I don't think that he can lose that since, well, he can lose, but I think from his standpoint, he can't lose because there's a serious risk of him losing power. Um, but I cannot possibly see how he can win. Um, he doesn't have nearly enough troops to occupy the country, occupying large cities uh, and engaging in urban warfare uh, which gives a tremendous advantage to the defender is going to be extremely difficult. Um, even assuming the Russians are relatively successful over that in the next weeks, months, um, they're going to be facing a tremendous insurgency on the part of Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it will be not hard to it'll be a lot easier to supply the ukrainian insurgency uh than for example it was for the united states and their allies in the 1980s to support an afghan insurgency there was a very good panel um at csis uh, last week talking about the incompetence of the russian military but also this insurgency question um so well, there's been a lot of debate about whether Putin is a rational actor um, uh, or if he has become kind of unhinged. <laughs> I, I have had the opportunity to meet with Putin a dozen or so times uh, in the context of this Valdai discussion club. And um, I, I will just say that uh, when I saw him on TV talking to his National Security Council, uh, and also when he made his rambling pitch to the nation, um, this didn't seem to be the same, the same guy. Uh, um, but even, you know, but even if you, you know, what is a rational actor? Well, being a rational actor, defining what a rational actor is to, depends on what your assumptions are. And I think it's obvious that Putin has gone on to the end of this with some deeply flawed assumptions. One, the military plan um, and the competence of its execution has been uh, terrible. Um, the push, the anticipated pushback of Ukrainians has been far greater. 
the pushback from Europe, et cetera, all these things we know. So the assumptions that he went in with um, uh, have turned out to be very, very poor. He sought to expose NATO as a sham, yet he has given NATO new life, as it hasn't had in decades. Uh, he believes Russians and Ukrainians are the same people, but he's done everything possible, not only in the last two weeks, but in the last eight years, to turn Ukrainians against against Russians. Um, so I don't know whether he's a rash, maybe whether he's a rational actor isn't the right question, but I just don't see that uh, the policy goals that he set are are can be achieved. Um, uh, but it it leaves us uh, still with a huge dilemma. And uh, while the war is likely to be drawn out, um, we are going to need to think again about a new European security architecture uh, for the future. And it's not going to be easy. And a lot of it will depend, I think, on, of course, on how things turn out in Ukraine. Okay, um, I apologize for uh, speaking so long, but let me uh, conclude there.